Hi everyone, uh, welcome to Birding at Home with BirdLife Australia. My name is Amanda Lilliman and we will get started shortly. Uh, there's still time to grab a quick cup of tea for Couple with the Birds or grab a water and um, come back and we'll get started soon. You can tag anyone you think might be interested in this talk uh, or share it with your friends. So we'll get started in a minute. I've got my cup of tea, so I hope you've got yours. And um, let's take a sip. So today I will be talking to you about the backyard birds in the top end in the Darwin region. Uh, I will also be talking to you about migratory shorebirds, but the talk won't be all about migratory shorebirds. It will mostly be about our backyard birds. And so uh, as you can see in the screen, I am a shorebird researcher. I'm based at Charles Darwin University. Uh, I work through the Threatened Species Recovery Hub. And I work on migratory shorebirds. So these are the birds that breed in the Northern Hemisphere. And they come to Australia every year for our summer season. And they spend their time on the coastline, feeding and resting every day. And a lot of these shorebird species are actually quite threatened or endangered. Um, because of issues such as habitat loss throughout their migration pathway. So they complete this epic migration between hemispheres, thousands of kilometres. And, uh, and so when they're here, the main uh, thing that we can do for them is to allow these birds to rest. And so the project that I work on is on the Far Eastern Curlew, which is our largest migratory shorebird here in Australia. And it completes this epic migration of up to 9,000 kilometres from Australia to its breeding grounds in northern China and southern Siberia. And so in the project that I work on, I've been lucky enough to be able to catch some of these curlews and put GPS tags on them. And the GPS tags are so small that they can track their movements. They don't inhibit the flight at all. But they tell us really important information about where these birds go. And so we can learn about their movements on the non-breeding grounds of what we call um, Australia, of these uh, intertidal mudflats. And then we can track their movement. And just this morning, I looked online to see where our birds were. And I found that all of our migratory, all of our Far Eastern curlews that we have these GPS tags on are actually on migration. Um, they're in places like Taiwan and in the Yellow Sea in China and North Korea and South Korea. So we've got birds um, in the air, on the ground at the moment. The reason why I can talk about migratory shorebirds in this backyard birding talk for the top end is because I'm lucky enough to live in an apartment that looks over one of the intertidal bays that we have here in Darwin, and it's actually an internationally important site. So I am so, so fortunate to be able to see these curlews and see some of our other migratory shorebirds from my room, from my balcony, and I just love it. So that's our um, Far Eastern curlew, the backyard bird, and I've also got an image here that a friend was um, nice enough to give to me because she knows how much I love the curlews. And, uh, and so that's our critically endangered far eastern curlew. And so going into our top end birds, we've got amazing top end specialties up here in Darwin in the Northern Territory. And I know that there's great birds everywhere around Australia and we've all got wonderful backyard birds. But I like to think that the top end has some of the best backyard birds. And um, we've, we've got actually over 300 species of birds just here in this top end Darwin region. 
Almost 20 of those are endemic to the top end region, so to our Darwin uh, area. And so that means that those birds are only found here in Australia. So we've, we're so fortunate that we've got a really uh, diverse range of habitat. A lot of the birds, are, um, actually a quarter of the birds that we have in the top end region, spend time in freshwater wetlands. And so we've got a lot of freshwater wetlands. We've got floodplains. We've got the coastal shoreline, intertidal habitat, uh, savannah woodland and grasslands, and also rocky country elsewhere. So we've got really nice, diverse habitat for a whole range of species uh, in town. We also have a lot of this monsoon forest. Uh, we've got coastal vine thicket. So we've got all this habitat that is home to lots of different species of birds. So we're really lucky with some of our backyard birds and to also have a lot of this green space right here in our city area. So we get some really cool top end backyard birds. And I know that a lot of people around Australia are already so connected with birds. We have a really strong emotional connection with birds naturally because we can see them and they can fly and, and humans just love the thought or a lot of people love the thought of being able to fly. You know, we have dreams about being able to fly. So up here in the top end, we are really connected with our backyard birds. We get some cool birds that come in and uh, through this bird life top end branch that I'm involved with, We've just started a new program along with ABC Darwin and it's called Our Top End Birds. And the program is all about understanding the local common birds that people of the top end are connected to. And that connection might be a social connection or a cultural connection or an environmental connection. So it's about understanding why people think certain bird species are important to them. And so we've launched that just this week and we found some quite um, interesting, some surprising nominations of bird species so far. And you can follow that program on the ABC Darwin Facebook page. Uh, and we will be sharing information about that with you in the comments. So you can click on the link and get a feel of some of our top end bird species that are important to local Darwin community. So that's our uh, top end, our top end birds. So our top bird. So it's kind of like our favourite bird, but uh, but we'll get to uh, we'll get to find out maybe a top five or a top ten list of birds that the local Darwin people are really connected with. And so. With our top end backyard birds, one bird that has come up already and so quickly people have uh, nominated this bird is the bush stone curlew. And this is a bird species that is found around Australia in different, in different areas, in woodlands, and in southern Australia, in Victoria and in New South Wales, it's a vulnerable and, and threatened species. Uh, it's undergone a lot of, uh, it's, it's gone through a population decline because of habitat clearing and the loss of suitable uh, habitats such as woody debris where the birds like to hide in amongst and burning regimes that are inappropriate for this bird species. But also um, they are predated by cats and foxes. Up here in the top end and in northern Australia, the bush stone curlew is actually doing quite well. It's one of our common bird species that we see in the backyard and anybody that lives up in Darwin will tell you something about this bush stone curlew because they've had some sort of experience with the bird. They hear it at night, they walk to the shops or walk along the foreshore and they see this bird and it stretches out its wings trying to scare you away or it does this call um, to kind of say, you're too close to me. But essentially, this is one of our common backyard birds. Uh, it's also a uh, 
culturally important bird species to the local Laikia people. So it's known as the devil bird and it actually means that it brings death. So local Laikia people um, don't have, um, don't like this bird essentially because it's, it's the bringer of death. Uh, and if you've heard the call, then you can probably agree that it's it's a bit of a scary call if you don't know what that call is. Like if you don't know that it's a bird, people think it's a woman screaming. So if you don't know that call, um, go and look it up because it's quite different to some of our other bird calls. One of our other top end birds is the magpie goose. And um, I'm actually wearing a dress with magpie geese on it. Uh, so this is one of our common backyard birds. And in the dry season, we have more magpie geese around the top end. In the wet season, these birds are breeding and, uh, and they're off in the floodplains. So with our seasonality here in the top end, we've got that, we've got that extreme um, wet season where there's high rainfall for a couple of months of the year after that which is the kind of stage we're in now it's it's considered the knock em downs and we go through a, a period where there's a few storms here and there uh, it's not really monsoonal and then there's still some humid days and it slowly changes into into the dry season, so which is our um, austral winter. So in southern Australia, it's winter, but in Darwin, in the top end in northern Australia, it's the dry season, and it's actually perfect. It's the most perfect um, summer holiday you can think of to, um, to spend time up here in the dry season, and that's also when we get a lot of our birds. So dry season, we've got these magpie geese hanging out around the top end, and then towards the end of the dry season, once we've had um, a couple of cold nights uh, in a row, we've actually got the fruiting or the seeding of uh, mango trees. And so there's mango orchards all around Darwin and people have mango trees in their backyards and there's some mango trees on school ovals. So we actually get these magpie geese coming into town and roosting on top of mango trees and feeding on some of the mangoes uh, and then also feeding just in the grasslands in urban parks and, and all around uh, Darwin. So we've got magpie goose all around us. They're feeding on the mangoes, uh, but they're not a significant pest to the mangoes, even though um, some people think they are. There is some current research on uh, the impact of the magpie geese to mango orchards and that is being conducted through Charles Darwin University so the results from that will be uh, out later this year or so. The magpie goose is also a another important bird species. Socially it's important because it's actually one of our um, waterfowl species that is hunted up here in the top end it's, um, it's got bag limits, but it is an approved species for hunting. Uh, and a lot of people are quite uh, connected with this bird through hunting. Larrakia people, the local indigenous people in Darwin, uh, it, is, it is a culturally important species for them to hunt and to eat. And, uh, and so people, you know, people have that connection with them. Environmentally, it's, um, it's a marker of the change in the season. So, uh, so people um, will use some of these bird species to indicate what's happening with the climate, essentially locally, uh, over, over the year. So that's the magpie goose. And then if we move on to another quirky backyard bird of the top end... This is a bird that a lot of people have a real love-hate relationship with. And it's the orange-footed scrub fowl. And I'd like to thank Gavin O'Brien for this photo. Oh, and sorry, Andrew Bell provided the photo of the bush stone curlew. So thank you for those photos. I didn't have photos of those species myself. So the orange-footed scrub fowl is one of, our, one of Australia's megapodes. 
there's three species of megapodes in Australia. In southern Australia, there's the Australian brush turkey, or the, uh, the, the bush turkey, as people call it. And there's also the mallee fowl in uh, Victoria and in southern Australia, South Australia. But here in northern Australia, we've got the orange-footed scrub fowl. And this bird will make a mound, which, is a, which they use as a nest. And it's this huge mound that they dig up they dig up the dirt and they dig up the leaves and pile it all up. And these mounds can be up to six metres or more in diameter. It's just incredible how these birds can make such a big nest mound. And what they do is they actually use that mound to lay their eggs uh, for, for incubation. So they put the eggs in there, the heat of the mound will incubate the eggs and then when the chicks are ready they, they will hatch and make their way out. And so these orange-footed scrub fowls have actually done well uh, in, alongside urbanisation. So they're found all around our Darwin top end area. They're found in uh, this coastal for the coastal monsoon forest that we've got, so the monsoon vine thicket and kind of this edge habitat with some of these other uh, habitat types. And they're in our backyards. They really love veggie gardens. They love any garden that you've got. If you've planted a, a beautiful uh, plant, anything, it could be anything, you've put in new soil, they're going to turn up and they're going to dig it up. That's just what they do. And so a lot of people just have a very strong opinion about this bird because they, um, they, they are ruining people's gardens. But essentially what they're doing is they are involved in nutrient cycling. So by digging up the ground, not only are they feeding on arthropods, so insects, worms, spiders, whatever they can catch down there, they're also moving that soil around and oxygenating the ground layer, the soil surface layer. So they provide quite important, a quite important role to the to the ecosystem and within uh, monsoon forests, but they, they've done quite well where, you know, humans buy bags of soil and we dig up our backyards and we plant new plants, uh, fresh plants in there and veggie gardens. So a lot of people uh, will often ask for advice on how do I stop the, uh, the, the bush chook from digging up my veggie garden and people try lots of different things and I've suggested we actually need a blog of the techniques that work and the techniques that don't work so that people can um, really figure out what works and what doesn't. Our next species is the black kite and this bird actually marks the dry season for a lot of top end people because uh, it turns up in our largest numbers during the dry season. It's considered a dry season migrant. In the wet season, the birds go away to what we think, uh, we think they go to central Australia. In um, the top end, during our dry season, we have a lot of fires uh, through the area, uh, both naturally occurring and by arson. And this bird is considered the fire hawk. Uh, there's been some research about the birds starting fires by collecting embers, sticks, burning sticks, and dropping them to other areas. And uh, the culturally, to local Indigenous people, it's considered the message stick bird because uh, the, the message stick is, is essentially, the fire stick is moving a message across the landscape, so from one clan to another. So that's the black kite, and it's common all around Australia. It's the world's most common bird, uh, and in our dry season, we get thousands of them, and they absolutely love the tip. There's, there's so many over at the rubbish tip. They love it. So if, you, if you're in Darwin and you want to see black kites in the dry season, go and take your rubbish to the rubbish tip and do some bird watching at the same time. Another raptor that we get up here is the rufous owl. 
And this Rufus owl is our largest owl up here in the top end. Its equivalent in southern Australia would be the powerful owl, which has a really large following of people because uh, it's, it's just so iconic. And so uh, some people up here in the top end are quite lucky to have this bird in their backyard. If they're near, uh, if they're near monsoon forest, this is uh, where the owl is, and there's a pair that spend their time and, and actually nest at the Botanic Gardens in Darwin. And so when people visit Darwin, they often will uh, put make a visit to the George Brown Botanic Gardens just to see this bird species. So um, that's another one that we have up here in Northern Australia, and it's, it's feeding on small mammals, other birds, reptiles, frogs, the works. And if we keep to the sky and move to our beautiful coloured parrots, we see the uh, red coloured lorikeet. So this is a different species actually to the rainbow lorikeet that is in um, southern Australia. And you can notice uh, it's only visible on one of the birds here, the middle bird, that's actually on the collar, it's, it is actually red or orange whereas the rainbow lorikeet has a green collar on it. So that's our, that's our red collared lorikeet. And it's, it's a common backyard bird that we, we actually count a lot of these birds up here during our Aussie backyard bird count in October during National Bird Week. And these are funny birds because they occur throughout the year, but they do increase in numbers in the dry season particularly uh, it's very entertaining towards the end of the dry season when we've got those mango trees fruiting and the birds will feed on the mangoes and even if the mangoes have fallen onto the ground the birds will feed on them and they actually get drunk off these mangoes and, and other fermented fruits so they it's the time of year when the birds are rolling around on the ground and they get taken in uh, to care for rehabilitation. So that's our red collared lorikeet. Our other uh, common backyard bird uh, is the red winged parrot. And this here is a beautiful male uh, taken by, it's a photo taken by Andrew Bell. So thank you for providing this photo. And uh, this is one of our common backyard birds, absolutely stunning. It will roost in large groups, actually, uh, resting in mangroves, so in the coastal environment. And you can see um, big flocks of these birds flying over, flying over creeks into mangrove environments for roosting. And, um, and that's, that's, um, that's probably a protective mechanism for these birds, and they're green and they blend in really well, so they, they actually will use that for camouflage. And so these birds are breeding from January to July. So they're in their breeding season now, so we can have a look out up here in the top end for, um, for any young birds that may be around or any nests of these birds, um, young birds that may be begging from their parents uh, for food. The rose crown fruit dove is one of our most beautiful uh, colourful small doves that we get up here and this bird is found in monsoon forest or vine thicket around the coastal areas and, um, and in the, the wetter rainforest habitat. So it's, it's feeding mostly on figs, I see this bird a lot of the time feeding in fig trees. It blends in really well, it can be difficult to get a photograph of because of how well it blends in. It is breeding um, also uh, during the dry season and towards the end of the dry season. And similarly, we have the Teresian Imperial Pigeon, which is another, um, another it's a, a pigeon and pigeons and doves are um, the same thing. It's just based on size. So pigeons are bigger than doves and doves are, are smaller. So the Teresian Imperial Pigeon, there's uh, three distinct populations of these birds across northern Australia. There's the southeast uh, Queensland or North, North Queensland population that's uh, purely migra migratory. So they, mi they migrate to uh, New Guinea. We've got our top end population here, and then there's a population in the Kimberley. 
And uh, the Teresian Imperial Pigeon here in Darwin, uh, it only some of the population migrates actually, and, and there's been a study that showed that uh, this species have, will actually stay in Darwin year round because of the availability of um, feeding trees, such as the palm tree that you can see here with its beautiful fruits. So this is another bird that is also culturally important to local Indigenous people as a totem bird. Uh, and it's another bird that interestingly will roost in mangroves, so in the mangrove forest. Uh, they'll come in in large numbers roosting together, uh, but this bird, as you can imagine, stands out really well from the mangroves, so it doesn't, it doesn't uh, blend in at all being bright white, absolutely stunning bird, can highly uh, recommend people going out and looking for the Teresian imperial pigeon. The blue-winged kookaburra is slightly different to the laughing kookaburra that's found in southern Australia. And this is, uh, this is one of our dry season uh, specialties as well. It's breeding from August to October every year. And has a very different sound to the laughing kookaburra that is found in southern Australia. So it doesn't quite get to that end full laughter uh, that, you, that you hear in the laughing kookaburra. So, and if we stay with our kingfishers, the forest kingfisher is um, another popular bird species that people uh, in the top end seem to enjoy in the uh, dry season because it's, it's breeding from September onwards. So people will see a lot of these birds during the dry season calling in their small family groups and uh, they actually breed in termite mounds in trees. So in the termite cavity, in the, in the tree, in, a, in this hollow of the termite mounds. So uh, you can, they, they breed exclusively in termite mounds. You can see them in uh, woodland areas or Melaleuca swamps, like on the edges of that or on the edges of uh, monsoon forest. So where it's that edge habitat with more of a drier forest. And this rainbow bee eater has got to be one of the most beautiful birds here in Australia. It's, um, as you can see, the name is so well suited being this rainbow bee eater. It's feeding on bees and other bugs flying in the air and it will take off from its perch and catch a bee or a bug and bring it back to the perch and then use that bill to whack the bee onto the branch and get the stinger out. So that one is one of our beautiful top end birds. And then this bird, the rainbow pitter, is found only in Northern Australia as well. And it breeds exclusively in the wet season. It's feeding on small bugs and beetles or arthropods in the ground. And it's digging up the ground as well. So similar to that bush chook or the orange footed scrub fowl, it's walking along the ground and it's scratching. It's using its feet to scratch the ground soil surface layer and pick up bugs. So that's one of our other top end specialties. And this bird here, the grey crown babbler, uh, this is another one that is quite special in the top end because in southern Australia, this bird is doing quite poorly. It's another bird that has been listed as threatened uh, because of changes to its habitat. But here in Northern Australia, in the top end, uh, it's actually one of our common birds and we can go to the foreshore or our coastal reserve just nearby and see these birds hopping along in their family groups. It's a slightly different looking bird to the Southern Australian subspecies because this bird has more of a rufous or rusty chest on it. And, uh, and that's the grey-crowned babbler. One of the other birds that I absolutely love up here is the lemon belly fly robin or the lemon belly fly catcher. It's a um, very sweet little bird. It's got the most beautiful call and common in our backyards and common in um, nearby coastal reserve, calling uh, along waterways and in the vine thicket forest as well. An absolutely sweet little bird. 
uh, and also has one of the, the smallest nests and will lay one small egg in this very small nest. And wow, what a stunning bird. It's the crimson finch or the flame finch or the red finch. There's a couple of different names for this species. And uh, this is a beautiful bright red male. It's, um, it's actually got some black on its head and it's got these beautiful soft white dots on the side of its body. And this bird is actually breeding at the moment. So it breeds through the wet season once there's been a lot of rainfall and there's been uh, more grass growing and seeding and the, the birds are feeding on grass seeds mostly. And it's also, um, it's also considered the pandanus finch because it breeds almost exclusively in pandanus trees. And these trees are, um, are common around the top end, so there's a lot of these finches around. So this is the beautiful crimson finch. And then my last bird that I will share with you is the chestnut-breasted mannequin. It's, um, it's another finch species, and this is another one of our common backyard birds up here in Darwin. And... Uh, another stunning finch that is breeding currently with um, it's breeding at the moment at the end of the wet season because we've had uh, lots of lots of rainfall and good amounts of grass seeds are available so the birds are have a lot of food to feed on and um, And so what, the, what happens with these birds is during the dry season, they'll come together in a big group and they can be found in, um, in the coastal reserve area, in large flocks, moving around, following grass seeds, and then towards the wet season, they will disperse across the landscape to areas where they will be breeding. So... What I've gone over today is a, um, a list of our common backyard birds up here in the top end. And, uh, and also spoke to you about some of the threatened species. So including those shorebirds and also some of the species that are threatened elsewhere in Australia, but up here in, in the NT in Northern Australia, they're doing okay. But if you're concerned about some of the birds uh, in your backyard or in areas where you visit and you would like to do something for these birds, you can get involved in um, Bird Life Australia's campaign on nature laws. So currently our nature laws are quite weak and they can be improved uh, with you using your voice to say that you want birds to be better protected across Australia and for um, environmental legislation to improve, to protect those birds. So um, we can all be bird custodians. And if you've tuned in, then you probably already are and you're probably out watching birds already and you know um, how wonderful birds are to look at. So, um, so give yourself a pat on the back for your wonderful achievements so far being a bird watcher and hopefully contributing to citizen science. And if you're interested in doing, um, doing more, you can always download the Bird Data app, which is by BirdLife Australia, and contributing to um, bird monitoring of the common backyard birds. So that's really important because um, our common birds across um, Australia and other places of the world are sometimes neglected. So, um, so it is useful to have, uh, to have data on our common backyard birds. And so I'll now um, look for the questions. So thank you for sending questions in already. How do scrub fowls take the temperature? I actually don't know. They don't have a thermometer, so um, that's one I think we'll have to research and come back to answer. Uh, any, is there any top end birds that you haven't seen? Yes, uh, the white throated grass wren, <laughs> and that's found in the sandstone country around uh, Kakadu National Park area, and uh, it's a species that is threatened and declining and it's been impacted by um, 
inappropriate fire regimes in their habitat. So, uh, so it is one that you have to um, go and do quite an effort to go and see. So, um, so I haven't seen that bird. Okay, so apparently the scrub fowls, the orange-footed scrub fowl, the bush took, uses they use a special sensor in their bills to take the temperature, which is just amazing. One thing that I'll just mention is that I haven't even mentioned honey eaters, and you may have noticed that. Uh, we actually have a lot of honey eater species up here in the top end. Just this morning I saw dusky honey eater and rufus Rufus um, banded honey eater just on my balcony in one of the plants. I didn't even mention any honey eaters, even though we are the land of honey eaters. So that's um, that's for next time. One of the um, one of the talks in this birding at home bird life Australia segment will be on uh, how to improve your backyard with. Um, how to make your, bird, your backyard more bird friendly, so with Holly Parsons. So that should be next Thursday if you're interested in making your backyard more bird friendly. And um, do we have any other questions that people are dying for an answer? No. So thank you everyone for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed learning about birds of the Top End region and uh, if there's anything you were interested in particularly, uh, you can always follow up with BirdLife Australia. There will be links in, uh, in the comment box of this video post and uh, I hope that you are all able to get out and enjoy the birds during this um, at home period. And thank you again for tuning in.